The best place to play fantasy football this summer is Underdog Fantasy. Their best ball mania tournament has $10 million in total prize money. And the best part is you just draft your fantasy football team and that's it. There's no waivers, no trades, no in-season management. Underdog gives you your best score each week of the season and the highest scores at the end of the year win. The champion best ball tournament team from last year was drafted in June, so there's no time like the present to take a shot at a million dollars with Underdog Fantasy. Plus, Underdog is going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with promo code PFF. And with that promo code, play $10 and get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head to Underdog Fantasy now or the App Store, play $10 with code PFF, and draft your best ball mania team today. Welcome, everyone. We are streaming live again over on YouTube. Uh, I know this is great podcasting for those of you listening on that format, but I will just to give you a little preview of what we're going to talk about in this episode. I'm going to do some of the news of the week, which I have been doing on Monday episodes. Not a lot to talk about right now, but I think the Baker Mayfield trade is definitely a NFL changing deal. Now, whether it has a vast impact or not, I think it can have ramifications for the Panthers, not only this season, but what they're going to end up doing in the future. And that's the interesting yin and yang of that deal, trying to figure out uh, whether it's worth it or not from their perspective. I'm going to talk that talk a little bit about these ESPN quarterback tiers and rankings that came out today, where they pulled 50 different executives, talk about how it feeds into recency bias and also It's a pretty good illustration, I think, of how strong the quarterback position is right now in the NFL, where you have guys who are on the outside looking in of the top 10 who are pretty strong quarterbacks. And I don't think it's necessarily wrong that they're on the outside looking at one of them being Lamar Jackson. And lastly, what I'm going to do now is I'm also going to continue my QB statistical GOAT series where I'm counting down the top 50 statistical quarterbacks of all time including guys who are currently playing, although you have to have played at least eight seasons to be part of that. We're going to get to, in this episode, we're going to go 30 through 21, so going 10 at a time. I'll finish up 20 through 11 on Wednesday. Next week, either on Monday or Wednesday, I'll finish it up with one, uh, you know, 10 all the way, counting all the way down to one. And this week, there are going to be some recently retired guys and a current quarterback Finally, we haven't really had many of those in the 50 to 30 range, but now we're going to get some of them here. we got some older guys, too. I'm going to integrate not only some of the pictures with the rankings that I've had on here, but also try to throw some little YouTube uh, stuff that I, that, I, that I ripped off here and some clips into the mix here so you can get a flavor for some of the older quarterbacks. Since the quarterbacks that we're going to be talking about this week, uh, you know, go back with some guys who are playing even back in the 50s. Uh, they may not have a great feel for how they looked, at least when they were on the field. So that'll be like the second two thirds of the episode, but the first third we're going to hit on the news of the week. So let's talk Baker first. The particulars here, fifth round pick can move up based upon whether or not he plays, I think, 70 percent of the time, which is kind of similar to these Wentz deals that we've seen in the past, although much less compensation overall. The Panthers are going to be paying five million here. Baker is deciding to eat a few million, which is a little bit surprising, although I get from his perspective how he wants to get things done now. He wants to go to probably the only team in the NFL other than the Seahawks that he would have a a pole position, a way to be the starter come this season and rebuild his brand and his value going forward. So yeah, he's giving away a few million, but it's all guaranteed. So he's actually giving away money that he was going to get paid no matter what there. And then the Browns end up eating the rest of this. I think the Browns played this as well as they could, uh, being that once they were in on Watson, the relationship with Mayfield was basically dead. Uh, they had Jacoby Brissett there. There was not going to be a repair there. And even so, I'm not as down on Brissett as some others may be. I don't think he's a great quarterback, but I think he can fit in well in a system where you can use heavy play action system where you can hold the ball a bit longer. Cause that's 
been his problem throughout his career as he holds the ball too long and not have as many adverse effects in that Browns system as he would have had with the Dolphins and their poor offensive line or even with the Colts before where Andrew Luck really transitioned to being a quick passer, a low time to throw passer before Brissett came in and then the sack rate and the pressure rates went way up because he's just not that that type of guy. So this will be a better fit for Brissett here. Um, so the Browns got out of it. They able, they're able to get Baker to, to take some of it. Uh, the more interesting things here. So one Baker Mayfield, one year deal, $5 million. You're giving up a fifth round pick with the possibility of it being a fourth. If we're just looking at 2022, we're just looking at this season, that type of deal for that level of quarterback. I mean, it's a, it's a smash win for anyone who's picking him up on that, that sort of level. Uh, Baker, depending upon what year we're talking about here, he is someone, according to PFF grades, has looked better than what his efficiency has been. If you look at an advanced metric like expected points added per play, by that sort of advanced metric, he's more of a, let's say, 15 to 20-ish sort of quarterback with appearances in the top 10 after that 2020 season, the first season with Stefanski where he played really, really well. From a grading perspective, he looks more like a, 10 to 15 ish sort of sort of quarterback of course having a poor year last year with the shoulder injury with the discombobulation of everything that happened with the receiving core and seemed like he was on wasn't on the same page as anyone there but again in the top 10 before and close borderline top 10 also as a rookie his his grading for us which gave him a, a big impact and a big standing if you combine those two types of metrics to great quarterbacks so i think it's safe to say that you could probably get a league average, maybe slightly worse type of quarterback play is what you should expect from him um, at a minimum. And while that in and of itself in a vacuum is not tremendously valuable for a team like the Panthers who are probably going to need better than league average play in order to get into the playoffs. When we compare it to Sam Darnold. And when we talk about either it being Sam Darnold or it being Matt Corral, and I love Matt Corral, but he's a third round pick. We can't ignore that. So we're talking about either being uh, Sam Darnold or Matt Corral, Sam Darnold, according to any way you forecast quarterback play. And the way that I forecast is normally looking at a combination of grades and efficiency, and then trying to get an idea of what, what they made their expected outcome is going forward. Sam Darnold amongst all 32 likely starting quarterbacks was dead last, but according to my forecast, even worse than someone like Drew Locke, because Locke hasn't played as much as Darnold. So even though he's been bad, also more substantial, longer track record of bad play is worse for projecting going forward than a shorter track record of bad, bad play. There's more likelihood that who knows, maybe things will get better if you haven't seen a lot of bad play and a bad track record there. But now for Darnold, we're going on four seasons of poor play and outside of a few windows, which early moves with the jets normally came at the end of the season. He played pretty well. Uh, and then with the Panthers, it came at the beginning of the season. He played pretty well outside of those little stretches. It's just been bottom of the league type of play. So the, the Panthers, if you're looking to optimize, and I think a lot of ways this trade was probably viewed in this way. If you're looking to optimize your results in 2020, this is a win here. Baker's going to get you maybe a couple more wins this season than you would have had versus Sam Darnold. And if finishing, you know, nine and eight, which is on the aggressive side for them or finishing eight and nine or finishing seven and 10 is enough to get Matt rules job saved. Then this could be the deal that does it for this season. Um, it's a dramatic improvement over what, what Sam Darnold was going to give you. So that's going to help rule keep his job going forward there. Now the problem with this deal and there are multiple problems with this deal, but I think this is the problem that was probably keeping an objectively great one year contract, keeping the demand low on that for other teams is if the best case scenario happens this season, it puts you in a worse decision point next off season. You say, how could that be, right? So let's say the best case scenario for the Panthers issue. The best case scenario for the Panthers, in my opinion, is something like going 
oh, 10 and seven, maybe. I, I, I guess anything is possible, right? So let's say they go 10 and seven. They sneak into the playoffs. They lose in the wild card round. That's probably something around a best case scenario for this Panthers team. Now you're coming back in the 2023 offseason. You have Sam Darnold's gone. You, you can rid yourself of, of Sam Darnold. You have Matt Corral as your third round quarterback who you have a decent impression of him after one season, but still nothing is, is certain. Your fan base is probably very happy with Baker Mayfield in that circumstance. Uh, there is a lot of talk of positive momentum of taking the next step forward, everything else. And Baker Mayfield is now a free agent. And I haven't heard whether or not this new deal is going to restrict the ability to franchise tag him, but let's just assume it doesn't, is not going to, is not going to hurt their ability to franchise tag him. So what are your choices now? What your choices are, do we kind of start over and say, turn it over to Matt Corral? We can't really go to the draft as easily because we had a good season. Um, we're not going to be up there as far as draft caps are concerned, but if there's really a guy we wanted to draft, do we, go ahead and cash in a lot of future assets to go ahead to go draft someone in a deeper quarterback class. Do we franchise tag Baker Mayfield at a cost of $30 million to, to bring him back here? Do we sign him to a long-term contract, which is going to, at that point, coming off of that type of season, like I said, best case scenario type of season, uh, a desperate franchise, wanting quarterback play and having that first pick overall pedigree, all those three things together. I don't know how you're going to get out of that without it lightening your wallet substantially to bring him back in any sort of long-term contract. And you're basically be committing to him at that point, committing to a quarterback who on a year by year basis has been up and down, look good as a rookie, look poor in his second year, had his best statistical and grading numbers in his third year, but at a low volume, and then had his worst year in his fourth season. So if he has a good year in his fifth season, how confident are you in him going forward? That's really the problem. The problem is best case scenario in terms of his play can lead to the most difficult scenario as far as the franchise going forward. Can save Rule's job, maybe saving Fritterer's job in the front office, although he might be safe either way. Might satisfy the boss man there, David Tepper, but you might be just in a little bit more of that purgatory with quarterback going forward, as opposed to if the worst case scenario happens and Baker washes out, you get to play Matt Corral in the second half of the season. You get to see how, how he looks. You're in a better position to draft a quarterback next season. Baker's off of the books at the end of the year. Matt Darnold's off of the books. You have a very cheap, quarterback you drafted in the third round who you got to look at and now you can make a clear-eyed decision going forward all of that happens with the context of Matt Rule is almost ass assuredly gone at that point he's gone and you're starting over with coaching from a franchise perspective from a, from a fan perspective from an ownership perspective while it's delaying any sort of positive momentum it could be the best place to be when we're talking about the probability of winning championships and sustained playoff success over the next five, 10 years, it still could be the best place to be to do a little bit of a hedge and a rebuild here. You've built a lot of pieces around the quarterback and give yourself a reason to go back out there in the market and bring someone in. So that's what complicates this here. Um, so why wasn't Baker, if he's a good one year, $5 million contract for a player who you might just want to take a shot at? Uh, I would put this as being similar to Jameis Winston post franchise tag where he left and he went to the saints still behind drew Brees at that point they could bring him in cheaply cheaper though than five million i think they brought him in for only a million or two let him learn the ropes bring him back again he finally starts and then they put him on a modestly sized contract that would be another sort of options for baker so why didn't we see that maybe the green bay packers looking at something like that i don't know about you but I'm not very convinced on Jordan Love's future for success. Maybe the Tampa Bay Buccaneers looking at something like that. You know, Blaine Gabbard or or, or whoever else that they have there is probably not going to be the the answer post Brady. You don't really know. Maybe Kyle Trask is better than than some would think. Their second round pick from from a year ago, and he could step in. 
But regardless, you could have just kept him behind brand name superstar quarterbacks in those two situations and not had to worry about any sort of rumbling of putting him in. He could rehabilitate. He could learn work habits. He can learn how to keep his head down and not make himself the story there. So I think those could have been situations, but doesn't seem like he was he was going there. Now, for anyone else in the NFL who may want to develop someone and have him as a backup, I think there's almost this problem where if your quarterback takes up too much attention, too much air out of the room, too much media attention, and it's also someone that fans may clamor for a little bit earlier, sometimes having a better backup quarterback, even at a cheap, cheap-ish $5 million a year, can be something teams don't want to do. I mean, people did not want to bring in Cam Newton because of the presence that he had and, and he, he might have there. I mean, I think to some degree, although obviously the Kaepernick stuff was mostly about the, um, the protest and his toxicity that he was perceived to have based upon that. But even then, he's someone you bring him in as a lot of attention. He has a high level of play. He's someone who has gone to a Super Bowl in the past. And then he's almost too good to be a backup. Um, so it's like they're actually less of a value than what they are if you can't take that media heat. So I think that hurt Baker here, and that's why this became the only option for him, having to take the discount, having to give up a few million dollars to go there. Um, I think this definitely increases the Panthers' chances a lot to potentially do something and win the division this year. It's just next year is going to be the difficult thing for the Carolina Panthers. All right, next thing I'm going to talk here is on ESPN came out with quarterback – ranking tiering where they talked to 50 different executives and they went through and ranked all these different executives gave their top 10 quarterbacks and then they compiled all that aggregated it and gave us the good information on here i know well, what do we need do we really need more quarterback ranking talk of course not but i'm going to do it anyway only shortly though only only briefly here to just check in on the recency bias of what's going in and how these rankings are are flowing around i always think that stuff is the most interesting to me so for those of you who do not have ESPN Plus, do not have access to this article by Jeremy Fowler, I'll, I'll let you in on what it says here. So the number one quarterback this year now, according to the compiled rankings here, is Aaron Rodgers. Uh, the lowest ranking he had was five. His ranking last year was number two. So what's weird about Rodgers is I thought it would still be Mahomes here, but I'm not against Rodgers. It's funny how the the arc has really changed on his perception in a way that he's not the default, you know, automatic number one quarterback in the NFL, despite the fact that he's won back-to-back -back MVPs. Yet I used to get a little bit annoyed when he struggled in 2015. He had a bounce back-ish pretty good season in 2016. He had a shortened but poor season in 2017. Uh, 2018, 2019, he was okay, you know, not great. And despite all that, he didn't really start to fall off of people's radar. Uh, Mike Sando does a very, who's now with The Athletic, who used to be with ESPN, does a very similar piece to this, where Rodgers was not falling out of being number one or maybe number two until the leading up to the 2020 season. That's when Rodgers start, finally started to fall. He would fall. He fell below Mahomes. He fell below Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson was very hot on him at that point in time. Um, so he started to fall at that point, which of course was the worst possible timing. Cause then that led directly into his back-to-back -back MVP season. So Rogers still doesn't have that glow around him though, for the fact that he's not a slam dunk number one overall guy coming off of back-to-back -back MVPs shows you that either he's lost some of that glow, or we've just seen the quarterback, um, competition stiffen so much with Patrick Mahomes as being the next guy. And Patrick Mahomes is second on this list, lowest ranking also of five. He was first last year. So he slipped a little bit, you know, nothing that interesting to me with these two. Josh Allen is third. I've heard Allen being ranked first by people this year, which I think is more of a trying to say something controversial than maybe what is really justified at this point. But Allen comes in third here. He was fifth in last year's ranking. So after he had that one good season, in 2020, he did enough, obviously, last year to move up a couple more spots. Uh, let me see who else we have. Brady is fourth. He was third last year, so he fell one spot. And then those are the only uh, – these top four guys are the only ones who were ranked in the top ten by all of the 50 different executives. These are the only four quarterbacks. Rodgers, Mahomes, Allen, Brady. Those four made it into the top 10 for everyone's rankings. Everyone else on this list was left off of the top 10 by at least somebody. Why? I don't know, but the, you know, they were. 
fifth, and this is recency bias coming out here. I know Bengals fans hate me because I have to continue to talk about, you know, how the Bengals were a little bit overvalued last year. Although I think they're going to be a better team this year, better team this year, not necessarily, you know, better results. It's going to be tough to beat going to the Super Bowl. I don't know, but they're going to be a better team this year. But Burrow being fifth here, mm, last year he was not in the top 10 after that rookie season. It's a little bit surprising to me. Um, vis-a-vis someone like Justin Herbert, that he would be a couple of spots higher. Spoiler alert, uh, Justin Herbert is down at seventh here. And it's not that, you know, it's not an egregiously high ranking. If Burrow was ranked above any of the top four guys, I think we could say it was egregiously high here. But he's definitely getting a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt and a little bit more of that Super Bowl shine than what was probably justified. Great PFF grading, efficiency by expected points, you know, not quite as good as some of these other guys. Matthew Stafford is six. And what's interesting about Stafford being six is he was six last year. So he had this Super Bowl winning season. He was number one in the NFL in his efficiency and expected points added. He had this huge jump where he had been a accumulator, volume passing accumulator, but not a highly efficient guy before. He legitimately jumped, but yet he didn't move in the standings here, which shows you how much of that was built into his rating last year, which I thought was way, way too high. But, you know, Stafford dunked on me all season long and uh, props to him for doing it. Uh, he's still at six so far this year. Justin Herbert is seventh. And again, it's it's marginal, but it just seems a little bit weird to me that maybe he wouldn't be a little bit higher right now. I mean, I, I think there's an argument for Justin Herbert potentially being the number one guy next season like i could kind of see that if he really has a gangbusters year this year him moving all the way up to number one i don't i don't really see that for anyone else i mean maybe burrow i guess you could say but i I don't really see burrow having that high end outcome as a possibility the same way we have justin herbert because remember herbert has basically every single passing record now after two seasons he was the rookie of the year Yes, they didn't make the playoffs, but they added a ton of talent there in San Diego. I mean, at San Diego, <laughs> I can't believe this happening two years after the way in Los Angeles. That is gonna is gonna put them there. So I thought that was a little bit interesting. Russell Wilson down to eight. I mean, you can't really argue too much with that. He was four last year, and if you went to the year before, like I mentioned before, the 2020 season, he was often seen as two or like a one B to Mahomes is one A. So he has fallen quite a bit. Uh, Deshaun Watson put in here at nine. Now, a lot of people were saying in reference to Lamar Jackson being off this list when I asked, you know, who are you going to replace him with? Because there are just a lot of good quarterbacks now. People were saying, oh, Deshaun Watson. It's like, okay, I get it. Like, you don't want Deshaun Watson as part of this list. But as long as he's in this list, he he's falling. He falls in these weird categories for people because he's being included in these in this list. Yet there's still, you know, this negative association, obviously, with everything that's going on with him. And, you know, I've talked ad nauseum about that sort of stuff. And again, we have to look at these things. We have to be able to compartmentalize sometimes when we're talking about a pure football standpoint. So from a pure football between the, the lines, you know, when, they, when he gets onto the field, you know, nine is too low for Deshaun Watson. He's probably more somewhere in the three to six range. But you get this squishy thing where if he's included in a list, people are baking in this other stuff to it. And then he ends up being nine where he should be three through six, you know, just excluded from the list, I would say. in a lot of these circumstances, because no one seems to be able to really rank him properly right now um, with everything else that's going on here. And then Dak ends up being 10 where he was seven last year. Again, Deshaun Watson was not in last year's rankings because of everything that was, that was going on. So honorable mention Lamar Jackson it's, it's one, this shows you how strong the quarterback class, the quarterback class is, and everyone in the NFL right now is that like I can't really argue that this is a a grave misjustice not having Lamar Jackson in the top ten. I mean, is he better than Dak? Maybe. Is he better than Russell Wilson? No. Is he better than Justin Herbert? No. Is he better than Matthew Stafford? Maybe. Is he better than Joe Burrow? Probably not. So like. There's only a couple of people who you can maybe substitute them in, but it's more like a coin flip type of exercise than anything else. Okay, the recency bias thing here, and again, I'm going to be hammering on this. Raiders fans, Bengals fans are not going to are not going to like me this season. But Derek Carr now beating the next honorable mention here. Like, what, what's going on with with the Derek Carr thing? We we don't have to think of him as a top ten quarterback. It's, it's like I get it; he had a good year. Um, the team had a good year more than Derek Carr, even having a good year. It wasn't an outstanding year for him. Uh, he had a career high number of yards thrown, but then again, 17 game season, you know, everything else, he, he completed some more deep balls, but that's notoriously uh high variance type of thing. The recency bias definitely 
shoots out with Carr here and where he is on this list being the second honorable mention and above Kyler Murray, who's who's next on here as an honorable mention. And Murray's sneaky undervalued here. I mean, let's remember the first six, seven games of the season last year, he was looking like an MVP candidate. So like out of these honorable mention types, Lamar Jackson obviously has MVP upside. Kyler Murray has MVP upside. Derek Carr, I'm sorry, does not have does not have MVP upside. Although he did get some MVP votes back in uh, 2014, 2014 or 2016. I can't remember which one, but he did get some MVP votes in the past. And then I also thought the funny thing here was the also receiving votes. It just has Kirk Cousins and it has no write up. Like <laughs> they decided we're not even gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna dignify Kirk Cousins with a write up. Uh, we're just going to say he also received some votes and then not really talk about him here. So not a ton of recency bias and what's going on with the quarterbacks there, but Burrow sticks out to me as being on the high side from a little bit of recency bias. Carr is another guy, and those are two guys we're probably going to be talking about a lot going into the season as far as the perception versus the reality there. Not that they're bad. It's just you know when you're looking at overvalued, undervalued, guys are on the upswing, and these are guys who moved up a lot again burrow moved from being off of the top 10 into number five Carr moved to being completely off of the radar now to being an honorable mention those are guys you're gonna have to look at and then the guys who have potentially fallen too much i mean maybe someone like amar jackson but i'm looking more at kyler murray as a guy who could break out this season we'll see if he gets the contracts or not i think he's deserving of it but he isn't viewed as the stability and the stable quarterback play that some of the other young quarterbacks are where I think he kind of, he deserves to be in that bucket. All right. Before we get to the goat QB discussion, let's talk manscape gentlemen all strive for gold in their life, right? Gold medals, gold watches, gold, everything. However, there's a certain type of man who goes the extra mile. He walks with the confidence of an Eagle and giggles in the face of danger. He is a big hairless winning machine. And when he unzips his pants, he sees platinum. That's right. Manscaped would like to introduce you to their biggest and best ultimate hygiene bundle yet, the Platinum Package 4.0. Manscaped is the leader in below-the-waist grooming. Now trust them for the whole shebang. Join 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with code PFF. Manscaped's brand new Platinum Package 4.0 is the biggest bundle they have ever offered. Getting you a bulk discount on Manscaped's top products. Get 20% off and free shipping with code PFF at manscaped.com. That's 20% off free shipping at manscaped.com. Use code PFF. It's time you enjoy the finer things in life and get yourself a platinum package for your platinum package. All right. Quick primer reminder, everything else that's going on with the statistical GOAT quarterback list. Again, we've already gone through some honorable mentions, some current players who didn't quite make the top 50, including Matthew Stafford, Kirk Cousins, uh, Cam Newton, if you want to call him a current player, I'm not sure what he's going to be end up doing this season. All of them, a little bit on the outside looking in in the 50s. Obviously, guys like Stafford and Cousin, they're going to have a chance to accumulate and and get into the get into the mix here in the next couple of years. Um, but just quickly thinking about this, the, when I bring up the images for all these different players, there are four different things you're going to see on it. You're going to see their QB goat ranking, which is their overall ranking. You're going to see their career, their peak, and their playoff rankings. And this is for value added. Career is looking at mostly at a statistic called adjusted net yards per attempt, which is really yards per attempt. So we're looking at efficiency more than volume here, although they do get credit for volume. So it's looking at efficiency there. They get bonuses for touchdowns. They get penalties for interceptions and penalties for sacks as part of this number. So there's that. There's a rushing value component where they get credit for rushing yards. They get credit for rushing touchdowns. So that career number is regular season, career, total value they've added. So longevity, you get more out of that. Guys who have shorter careers, even if they're playing at a high level, learn those careers are going to be lower on that. I like the value peak. I'm not just going to look at career value. I'm going to look at peak value as an addition, as a boost to guys who have a higher peak value and a drop to those who don't have as much of a peak value. So the peak number is the ranking amongst, and this is a total of 115 different quarterbacks I was looking at who had a chance of maybe being top 50 type of quarterbacks. So that peak ranking is looking at every rolling five-year period of their career, the value added, the highest number for that highest five-year stretch of peak play. Playoff is the value added, but in the playoffs. 
And older quarterbacks get a little bit more credit if they played fewer games because there just weren't as many games in the olden times. You know, the really, really old quarterbacks were playing one playoff game. It was just a championship game. Then you go to two games, three games, and now, you know, you can have four different games on a Super Bowl run if you're coming from the wild card round. Okay, so that's basically it. I'll talk around it some more, the details. If you want to go back to the episode a couple of Wednesdays ago, that's going to go into the painstaking details on all this works. But we, we get it, right? We get it. I don't have to go through every single little detail as far as this is concerned before you're going to get what's happening here okay so we're starting this is 30 through 21 and i will say before getting into it and i mentioned this somewhat last year is you know the statistical quarterback thing you know all stats don't tell the whole story you have to have context you have to be able to watch them you have to you know know their surrounding talent this and that yes definitely part of it but again by just scraping a bunch of data from pro football reference for all these guys, quarterbacks going back to the modern era. So got anyone who played the majority of their career in the late 1940s to present. Um, just doing that, just looking at their value that they've added over league average play. That's all with my little formula. 60% of it is, is the career regular season. 20% is their peak during the regular season. 20% is playoffs. Just doing that. If you look at the top 25 names, and we're going to, some of them will be part of today's episode. The top 25 names, there's only one player who is currently eligible for the Hall of Fame, who, who ranks in the top 25, who is not in the Hall of Fame. I'm not going to spoil who that is, but there's only one player. There are some who are not yet eligible for the Hall of Fame because they, re, they retired recently, um, who might not, or, or still playing, who might not make the Hall of Fame who are not locks for the Hall of Fame. But there's only one eligible player who did not and probably will never make the Hall of Fame unless they get in as like a senior status later. Um, so that shows you how much the stats comport with people's opinion. You know, whether we like it or, or not, efficient quarterback play is what comes through as far as quality play for quarterbacks. So being able to harness these stats while they're not correct versus – people's opinions it does give us a great check on what we may be thinking maybe some guys who are over undervalued in their historical scheme and effect all right some of these guys are a little bit older some are not uh maybe be educational for those who aren't for, for those who are a little bit older but we're going to start with number 30 here and that is daryl lamonica for those who don't know daryl lamonica he has probably the best quarterback nickname of all time he is known as the mad bomber daryl lamonica and he was a mad bomber uh he lived up to that nickname 6.3 percent career touchdown rate which is one of the highest ever 15 yards per completion both top 10, 10 numbers of all time uh in 1967 he led the nfl in touchdown rate and interception rate during the same season showing how they had that vertical downfield offense with the Raiders. And for counting stats, he also led the NFL in touchdowns and interceptions in 1969, throwing it quite a bit there. Uh, let's talk accolades first for LaMonica. Two-time All-Pro in the AFL. This is back when there was a separation between AFL and NFL as far as he's two-time first-team All-Pro, one-time AFL champ. But he that, that AFL championship was back when the AFL and the NFL were separate. So then they played together in the first Super Bowls and he lost the second Super Bowl uh, to the Packers. He was also 1967 AFL player of the year. So I don't know how you want to rank that versus being an NFL MVP, but MVP type of play. So he played from 1963 to 1974. From 63 to 66, he was with the Buffalo Bills. He was drafted in the 24th round by the Bills. And he didn't start basically the entire time there, uh, only served in relief or spot starts for those first four seasons before being traded to the Raiders. And that's when things really started to take off for him. So those who haven't who haven't really watched the downfield offense here for for La Monica, um, you have to see that he wasn't the most impressive passer to me when I'm looking at how he played, but he got the job done with these incredibly gaudy statistics throwing the ball down the field. Uh, let me let me let me play some some stuff here for for Lamonica. So you can see that he was just known for chucking the ball. 
basically at all times in this Raiders offense. And that's why the Raiders are known for the longest time, especially when Al Davis was being there as being obsessed with speed because starting with LaMonica and a bunch of other quarterbacks there, they were known for just being a big, big play offense. So what are the things holding down LaMonica? He is not in the Hall of Fame. So LaMonica is not in the Hall of Fame despite being 30th on my list. So what are the things that are that are holding him down versus some others? Okay, well, some things that are holding him down. Number one, short career. As I mentioned, he did not start those first few years of his career. And he basically had eight no, excuse me. He basically had six full starting seasons. That's it. He was above average efficiency in all of them. He accumulated a lot of value here. As you see, he was 30th all time in his career value, but he didn't have a strong, that strong of a peak. He was just really, he was just good, good, not great across this entire time. The other thing that holds him down is surrounding talent. So the offensive line may be the greatest offensive line in NFL history because not his entire career, but the second half of when he was with the Raiders, Art Shell came there to join Gene Upshaw and Jim Otto. So Gene Upshaw, guard Gene Upshaw, tackle, left tackle, Art Shell, and center Jim Otto. Not only are these guys Hall of Famers, they were all selected to the NFL 100 team. So if you go through the NFL 100 team, if you count up all the centers, all the guards, all the, the tackles, the offensive tackles on there, you take out the pre-modern era players, so the players from the 20s and 30s, there's one of them in each one of those categories. There are 15 total names there. 15 total players made of offensive linemen, modern era players made the NFL 100 team. Upshaw, Shell, and Otto all made the NFL 100 team. So that means one out of five, you know, quick math here, 20% of the NFL 100 offensive linemen, he played with 20% of the NFL 100 offensive linemen. That's a pretty awesome offensive line to have that gave him lots and lots of time to throw the ball down the field. Secondly, if we look at his receivers, he played with Hall of Famer Fred Bolitnikoff. Um, Bolitnikoff, obviously, uh, for those who are familiar with the award given in college for the best college collegiate wide receivers named the Bolitnikoff Award after Fred Bolitnikoff. Uh, and he also had a couple of monster seasons from Warren Wells. Warren Wells is a dude that I didn't know about at all before. But you look here, he only really had three NFL seasons where he started. And in those three NFL seasons, he led the NFL in touchdowns twice and in yards once. Wells, in 1969, had 1,260 receiving yards and 12 touchdowns, only 47 receptions. So he was averaging 27 yards per reception. Okay. Uh, and this is all in 14 games he did that. So he could have even been like a borderline Hall of Fame talent, but he only really started for three years because he was actually drafted into the Army and ended up missing time there. And when he came back, he had legal troubles, assault issues, got arrested, uh, drug and alcohol problems, and then washed it out in the league. But for a while there, LaMonica had this, you know, unholy supporting cast that was just that that couldn't be stopped of perhaps the greatest offensive line ever, along with Blitnikoff and Wells, these amazing receivers who could get open down the field. So I think that is probably also that is probably one of the reasons why he could be a little bit overvalued by his stats here. And he also did not make the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, so LaMonica, for me, would I have him in or out? I'm fine having him out of the Hall of Fame, but he's definitely someone who probably deserves a little bit more recognition than what he's been given over his career. Okay, here's a guy that you all know about here. Tony Romo comes in at QB Goat 29. His career value is a little bit lower at 32. His peak is higher at 25. And his playoff value, as we all know, especially early in his career, not so great. He only ranked 56th in his playoff value added here. Okay, so what can we say about Tony Romo? Romo's been a controversial guy. He is in some ways similar to LaMonica in the fact that he just doesn't have a lot of playing time, especially when we're talking about playing in an era with quarterbacks like Peyton Manning, um, Tom Brady, Ben Roethlisberger, Drew Brees, Philip Rivers, uh, all these different guys, even Eli Manning, if you want to get to the Eli, Eli Manning discussion, who played a very long time, started for a very long time, accumulated for a very long time. Tony Romo did not do that. Tony Romo was an undrafted free agent. Officially, you know, he played 14 years for the Dallas Cowboys, but he didn't start the first two seasons. 
He started 10 games his third season when he came in for relief of Drew Bledsoe. Drew Bledsoe might have the award for like usurped by the best, <laughs> like greatest talent, uh, greatest talent stealing your job award, getting, um, was it Johnny Pipp? Is that what they call it? Uh, by the, the greatest quarterbacks ever, Tom Brady and then uh, and then Tony Romo coming in for Bledsoe. And he also missed some significant chunks of time due to injury. Um, he, only, he missed 10 games midway through his career in 2010. He missed most of 2015 due to injury. And then his preseason injury in 2016 led to Dak taking over. And then, you know, he didn't play in 2016 as Dak continued to hold that there. So we only really had eight full starting seasons. As far as accolades are concerned, not much for Romo. One second team All-Pro in 2014, his best efficiency season. He was tied for third in the MVP MVP voting that year. He was tied with uh, DeMarco Murray in voting that year behind the MVP Aaron Rodgers. And J.J. Watt was second in MVP voting in 2014. So consistent near elite play without being the best quarterback any season. That's who Tony Romo was. But... If you want to talk about peak here, and I said his peak is a little bit higher. So if we want to look at quarterbacks, again, he only played the, he only started for the eight seasons, but any quarterbacks who had efficiency that was about one and a half standard deviations above normal, it's kind of a weird way to describe it, but there's this number called adjusted net yards per attempt plus where it rates it on a scale, a uh, hundred, it's scaled at a hundred where a hundred is, is is even 120 is about one and a half standard deviations above normal. So if you have that 120 cutoff points here, so you're about one and a half standard deviations above normal quarterback play. So that means you're roughly in the top 10% ish of quarterback play for, for those seasons, top 10, 15% of quarterback play. If you look at quarterbacks who half of their seasons hit that mark, half of their starting seasons hit that mark. There are only four Roger Staubach, Peyton Manning, Steve Young, Tony Romo. That's it. But again, not did not have the longevity. Uh, if you want to look at Tony Romo's rankings by season, by these starting seasons, by this adjusted net yards per attempt, which again, my opinion, the best measure that you can look back on. He was fourth, fifth, seventh, fourth, sixth, 14th. So one bad year, ninth, and then back up to, to second again. Um, looking at the components of quarterback play, you know, yards per attempt is the foundation, right? He's elite. He was very elite there. He led the NFL twice. Uh, also elite touchdown percentage leading the NFL twice, but gunslinger, very apt for Romo below average in interception rate or worse, I should say the normal in interception rate, most of his seasons. But if we look at guys with yards per attempt, career yards per attempt in NFL history, it's Otto Graham, Norm Van Brocklin, Steve Young, and then Tony Romo. Um, it's very interesting to look at his win probability added curves too. There's great work by Benjamin Morris, who was working at 538, where he would show, you know, based upon the team's current win probability, like if they were down a lot, let's say they had a 10% win probability, what would the what were their actual, how often did they actually win versus those win probabilities? Roma had this very strange curve where when the team was leading and they had a very high win probability, he wasn't that good. He was about average in those circumstances. When he was way behind, he was phenomenally good at winning games when his team was way behind. Uh, Roma was also a mobile quarterback, so that adds it to it, uh, but it was mostly within the pocket. You know, he did not rush a lot. He only had 620 yards and five rushing touchdowns in his career six total playoff games this is what hurts his playoff number he only won two of those games he had okay efficiency in the playoffs but it was worse than his career average his best run was in 2014 ending with the famous you know Dak. i'm not Dak caught it uh des caught it game in green bay but he only had 19 attempts in that game versus 35 for rogers that's kind of a crime against romo there so let's let's hit the big question here does tony romo belong in the hall of fame I think I had been tricked a little bit into overstating his Hall of Fame case because of the contrast to Eli Manning. Because this Eli Manning discussion, who again, according to my statistical GOAT rankings, is ranked 61st, I think. So he's you know out of the discussion statistically for being in the Hall of Fame. So because of that, you look at Tony Romo, uh, you know, they're in the same division. There's a lot of ill will, to say the least, between maybe some Cowboys fans and some Giants fans. 
that you would say, oh, you know, Elam Manny doesn't deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. So therefore, I'm I'm going to pump up someone like Romo, who's a very big contrast to Eli Manning as someone who didn't have the Super Bowl success, someone who didn't have the longevity, but had peak play. Yeah, I think that was a mistake, though. I think it was almost I was buying into that a little bit too much. There's just not enough there for Romo. If he had the longevity or the playoff success, a little bit more playoff success or, you know, just had a little bit more of the higher end accolades, like an MVP or something like that. Maybe you can make the case for him. For me, just not quite enough to get in. So I would say lean no on Romo, but clearly a high end player. When he was at his peak, he was one of the best to do it out there. He just played in an era, which also makes things tough, where again, you're playing with Manning, you're playing with Brady, you're playing with Breeze, you're playing with the end of Favre's career, uh, all these types of quarterbacks. It makes it tough to stand out in that sort of era also. Okay, uh, 28, Kenny Stabler, another great nickname here, the snake Kenny Stabler. Stabler is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he is also on the all-decade team that the Hall of Fame puts out for the 1960s. His other accolades, including Super Bowl championship, 1974 MVP, where he also was first-team All-Pro at quarterback. And in 1976, he was second-team All-Pro and third in the MVP voting. And he led the NFL in net yards per attempt in both of those seasons. Another one, it was somewhat of a gunslinger here. Uh, he is notorious, absolutely notorious for not putting in much preparation. Some people love that. Some of his teammates love that. You know, party hard, play hard, work, work not that hard. <laughs> what it came to before the game for Staber, but then work super hard during the game. One of the most talented guys out there, didn't have a rocket arm. Um, and I think sometimes when you look at left-handed quarterbacks, they appear to have a little bit not as strong of an arm as they actually have sometimes. But this dude was an athlete, like a crazy type of athlete here. He was um, he averaged he averaged 30 points per game uh, as a basketball player in high school. He was good enough as a left handed pitcher that he received minor league contract offers from the Astros and the Yankees so he could play. And he went to Alabama to go play college uh, football instead for legendary coach Bear Bryant. But again, he was someone, you know, who got kicked off the team at one point and then reinstated. He's, he said that when he was in high school, he got kicked off his team and then reinstated. He had lots of different violations and probably would not sit well with an up, you know, with a, with a tight uh, button up type of coach right now in the NFL. But back then things could, could be a little bit better. Um, so he has the high end, he has the high end play to have gotten an MVP voting, but you know what? He also, benefited greatly from a lot of the stuff we talked about with Daryl LaMonica earlier, where he had the same offensive line. I mean, Jim Otto was near the end of his career, Hall of Famer Jim Otto, but Upshaw and Art Shell were there for basically the entire prime of Kenny Stabler. So he had two awesome, awesome players there. He had Fred Bolitnikoff, Hall of Famer at the end of his career, but fellow Hall of Famer, although Cliff Branch was a little bit of a late addition to the Hall of Fame, so he's kind of like a second tier Hall of Famer. Cliff Branch did come in there. Um, and he was a first team all pro in 1974. And then he had Hall of Famer Dave Casper at tight end. So you have ha two Hall of Fame wide receivers, a Hall of Fame tight end. And then at least at one point in time, three Hall of Fame offensive linemen. Yeah, that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty strong supporting cast there for Stabler, which helps support him there. Now, the one thing I want to talk about Stabler almost more than anything else is one of my favorite plays of all time. And that is the Holy Roller play. For those who don't know, this is a regular season game between the Chargers and the Raiders. I'm actually, I have the, I have the footage here. So if those, those of you watching on YouTube, I'm going to bring it up here for the Holy Roller play. I'm going to, I'm going to give you some background first and then, and then I'll bring it up. So uh, 10 seconds left in the game. The Raiders have possession of the ball on the Chargers 14 yard line trailing by six points. So Stabler went back. And then as you'll see on this play, he figured out a way to fumble. I'm putting fumble in quotes here. And then eventually end up scoring the touchdown, which ended up resulting in a rule book change for the NFL. So let's go ahead and hit the holy roller play here. So as you can see, Stabler was going back in the pocket. And, you know, somehow when he just flings the ball forward like that, that that, that was able to be for the refs to, to think that it was it was actually a fumble. And then a uh, running back goes to pick it up. He kind of kicks it forward. And then Casper kicks it a couple more times into the end zone. And it ends up being the, the befuddled refs look at each other and call it a touchdown. Again, I'm just going to replay it here in the background so everyone can look at it while I'm talking about it here. 
Um, so they end up winning the game, kicking the extra point. And like, if the, even if the ball is recovered at the 14, uh, I mean, that's not going to work right at the line of scrimmage. So that's why Stabler flings it forward. It's recovered by the running back. That's not going to work because I'm going to run out of time. Even, even if it's recovered on the one or two yard line, it's not going to work. But then Casper kicks it forward into the end zone, which ends up leading in a, a score for the Raiders and a win in that game. Now, for those who know the rule books pretty well, that changed afterwards. So number one, it should have just been an incomplete pass. So anyone who intentionally fumbles forward like that, it's an incomplete pass and that the game should have been over then. Um, number two, the rules have been changed now so that within the two minute warning, the ball cannot be advanced by any recovery other than by the player himself. So if this happened here and Stabler fumbled it at, I don't know what that was, the 16 yard line, and it's recovered eventually in the end zone for it's not a touchdown. You put the ball back on the 16 yard line, the clock runs out and the game is over. So I thought that was one of the funnier plays. You know, he's also involved in the ghost in the post play, um, sea of arms play. He, there's a bunch of different plays here for Stabler, which kind of adds to his legendary status, which I don't, I'm not a huge, you know, you can't tell the story of the NFL guy, but Stabler is one of those guys where maybe, maybe you really can't tell the story of the NFL without having Kenny Stabler into the Hall of Fame. You combine that with the MVP, you combine that with the high end play, and he's he's a he's a Hall of Famer for me. And he comes in at 28 on this list. Maybe you could bump him a little bit higher because of all of that intangible, non statistical sort of stuff to his resume. All right, this is a name not a lot of people are going to know about. Roman Gabriel comes in at 27 here. The picture that I have up here, and I'll describe it for those listening on the podcast, he basically has a Cowboys defensive lineman draped all over him, holding onto the face mask as he throws the ball forward here. I'm using that here because when I watched Gabriel play, it was a lot. Of, it's a lot of fun to watch his highlights. He's 6'5", depending upon who you listen to somewhere between 220 and 240 pounds. He's just a, he's just a mammoth of a human being. He was an outstanding player at North Carolina state, North Carolina athlete of the, you know, the century or whatever they, they designated him at. He was the number one pick in the AFL draft chosen by the Oakland Raiders. And he was the number two overall pick in the NFL draft selected by the Rams. And he decided to go to the Rams and to the NFL. Um, 16 years in the NFL, 11 years as a primary starter, 1969 MVP. But other than that, he doesn't have anything but pro bowl. So not a lot of accolades, but he does have that 1969 MVP. Uh, like I said, he was just a hell of an athlete at North Carolina state. He was inducted into the college football hall of fame back in 1989. Okay, so from 1962 through 1965, with the with the Rams to start his career, he had difficulty. Gabriel had difficulty securing the starting quarterback job. He would come in and he would play when other quarterbacks were slumping, but he wasn't given the chance to be the man. And that seems to have been a massive mistake because on a very poor Rams team, the 23 starts that Gabriel had in that 62 to 65 range again there, there's it's very inconsistent the team was 11 11 and 1 that doesn't sound great but in all the other 33 games during those seasons where other quarterbacks started those games the rams were 4 27 and 2 so they were putrid just a putrid team outside of gabriel who really was doing everything that he could on that team so george allen who becomes a famous head coach later for the washington redskins he comes in to coach the rams in 66 he puts gabriel roman gabriel in as the starter and the rams go from four and ten to eight and six then in the next few years they win 11 games 10 games 11 games nine and eight so over that six-year stretch where they were winning all those games gabriel started every single game now he started to have shoulder and knee problems in 71 i would say i made this comment on twitter that he was maybe josh allen and in some people said he wasn't quite the athlete that Allen was, although we had that Allen type of size. So I'll accept that pushback. And people, I think maybe like a common, if you're talking about modern guys, like a combination of Allen and early career, Josh Allen and early career Ben Roethlisberger. He ran more than Roethlisberger, like design runs than Roethlisberger, but not quite as much as, as Allen. He scored 30 something touchdowns but he didn't have a ton of rushing yards. He didn't scramble and do design runs in the middle of the field like Allen. Um, but he was also kind of like Roethlisberger and taking a ton of punishment and it caught up with him 
with the shoulder and knee uh, problems that he had and missing time later in the, in the season. He, so after consecutive starts, 89 consecutive starts over eight seasons, he missed two games and then he started to miss more and more as it went on. Now he did have a comeback where after he was traded out to the Eagles later on in his career, um, he improved the Eagles team that went two and 11 the year before to five, eight and one. He was voted comeback player of the year. And he just had a massive volume season. He had 200. He led the NFL in 1973 with 270 completions, 460 attempts over 3,200 passing yards, 23 touchdowns while having the lowest interception rate in the NFL. He also had a low interception rate, which reminds me of Josh Allen. What those who might not really know about Allen is Josh Allen is like in his first two years, he kept his efficiency, the thing that really kept his, his passing efficiency from not being awful those first two years was not throwing interceptions. He was careful with the ball in that way. He did fumble a lot, but he was careful with the ball in that way. So Gabriel generally had a low yards per attempt, um, but good sack avoidance, good interception uh, avoidance, which gave him a lot here. He ends up being 30th in my rushing value added here because of all those rushing touchdowns. And I have a little bit of footage here for Gabriel for those who want to watch what will give you some flavor for for not only him running the ball here. So you're running the ball around the goal line. He was used pretty often as a goal line running option here. But his scrambling ability and, you know, he's not the most fleet of foot, but he's making some guys miss, especially bigger linebackers out there back in the day. But this is what I'm really talking about here when it comes to Gabriel. Shedding tacklers, being able to throw the ball in here, avoiding the rush, and then chucking the ball 55 yards on a dime down the field. Those are the type of plays that remind me of the Roethlisberger, of the Josh Allen, of guys like that, that he's just a lot of fun to watch. And he just never had really good surrounding talent around him. I don't think he has the qualifications to really get into the Hall of Fame, but man, if he would have played on you know, a team like one of these Raiders teams that was just stacked with talent all over the place, who knows what he could have done um, because we saw when he went to Philadelphia and they really just opened up the passing game that he ends up being this precision passer who avoids sacks but yet has a great sense in the pocket for also being able to get away from pressure and shed defensive players and still get the ball off down the field. A really rare combination of guy and, and probably a talent level that belongs in the Hall of Fame, but it's hard from a resume perspective to get him into there. All right, let's go to uh, QB 26, Boomer Esiason. Boomer, uh, 34th is career ranking here. So outside, on the outside looking in as far as Hall of Fame is concerned, but his peak is 14th best of all time. Super strong peak here. Playoffs, 71, not so great. He was really bad in that playoffs where they ended up losing to uh, Joe Montana and the 49ers in, what was it, 1984? No, it wasn't 84. It was 80. Um, I should have had this in front of me, 88 and 88 to the, to the 49ers. And, um, I think his perception has been hurt boomer because first of all, Norman Julius Esiason, if you want to know what, what uh, boomer's real name is, I think, uh, Norm, maybe you can call him. I think he's been hurt by the fact that this super high end play that he had when he was with the Bengals. Maybe some people just don't recognize how high end it was. They're not the most flashy franchise there. So he had some super high end play there, but he was, he struggled later when he was playing with the jets. And then at the end with, with the Cardinals. So I think that hurt his perception as far as being someone who would even be considered to be in the hall of fame. And I don't think he's done himself any favors as far as his studio work and broadcasting work. I'm not sure if he comes off as the most likable guy there also. And I think that may have hurt him a bit um, as far as his perception is concerned out there in the popular world for people who didn't have a chance to see him play that much. But he was the MVP and first team all pro in 1988. Uh, Bengals went to the Super Bowl that year and lost in the Super Bowl. So how, how do we get to the 14th best peak, five-year rolling peak for a Siasen? Okay, so from 1985 to 1989, that five-year period, for adjusted net yards per attempt, my preferred metric here, he ranked, here is, here's his yearly ranks, third, second, seventh, first, and fourth. That's pretty good. Pretty, pretty good there. Um, right near the top, all those years in a row. And then even for the rest of his career, he had four more top 10 seasons, but nothing like that peak that we saw there. Now, I think his surrounding talent was fairly weak, but he doesn't really get a lot of credit for that. He had Anthony Munoz, the left tackle, you know, maybe the best left tackle ever. Um, so that's definitely true. 
Uh, but he didn't play with any other Hall of Fame Hall of Famers on his team in those high end years. And in fact, he never even played with someone who got a first or second team All Pro in their career ever. Uh, his wide receivers were Eddie Brown and Tim McGee. Tight end was Rodney Holman. These are all guys where he spread the ball all over the field, and they're all getting between 30 and 50 receptions. Uh, the backfield got a lot of hype because of Icky Woods and the Icky Shuffle, but not like Icky was a, an outstanding player. James Brooks was probably a better player and also a good pass catcher out of the backfield, and those guys got a lot of attention. But I think we know now that you know those two running backs are not going to make a quarterback great. While he didn't have the strongest arm, and again, maybe it's his left left-handed quarterback bias that we have against there. He was primarily a vertical passer, a size, and he averaged around 13 yards per completion during his career. Uh, he was up to 16 yards per completion during his MVP season, and he was also a little bit better runner than most people will remember. He averaged about 200 rushing yards per season during that five-year peak play. That also pushes up his numbers there. Um I'm fine with him not being in the Hall of Fame, but he's not a laughable case for Hall of Fame, as some people might think. And if he would have won that Super Bowl, you know, MVP, Super Bowl, super high peak play, we're talking about one Joe Montana incompletion at the end of the Super Bowl, even if Asias did not play well in the Super Bowl. We're talking about one Joe Montana uh, interception that was dropped near the end before that before that final touchdown to, uh, to John Taylor. If that happens, Asias would have the Super Bowl ring, the MVP and the peak. And that might be enough to really get him into the conversation as it works. Now he is not in the hall of fame and not going to get in the hall of fame. Okay. Top 25. And this is where we're coming into a lot, almost substantially, almost all hall of famers here. Number 25, Kurt Warner. Uh, it's funny when you bring up Kurt Warner, cause I'm trying to get an image of him that it's like 90% this Kurt Warner movie images. <laughs> I was going to put the guy on here. Actually, I was going to put the actor on here instead of Kurt Warner as a joke, but it wouldn't have been that funny. So um, let's talk Warner here. Somewhat of a controversial hall of fame case. I think he's clearly a guy who should have gotten in. Uh, he played from 99 to 2003 with the Rams, 2004 with the Giants, and then the Cardinals from 2005 to 2009 accolades. He's got a lot of accolades. Hall of Famer, Two-time MVP in 99 and 2001. First team All-Pro both of those years. He won a Super Bowl championship. And he was a Super Bowl, Super Bowl MVP. And he's been to two other Super Bowls that they lost. So his peak is kind of understated. Like how amazing his peak is by this number that I have here. Because you see that according to my calculation of the five-year rolling period, his peak is 24. But if you shorten it up a bit, if you say let's only look at three years for a peak... Um, then he really has an incredible stretch because he had an MVP, he had an injury shortened season, and then he had another MVP. And during that time, if you would have just looked at that, he would have been more like a top 10 peak of all time before going to the Giants there. And what hurt Warner is his lack of playing history. Uh, so he only started 12 games, four seasons. Okay, only four seasons. He started at least 12 games. 1999, 2001, his two MVP seasons, uh, 2008 and 2009 with the Arizona Cardinals. He was benched quite a few times during his career. The Rams benched him for Mark Bolger near the end of his time there. The Giants benched him for, you know, top pick Eli Manning. And the Cardinals benched him for Josh McCown and Matt Leinart at different times. But he kept on coming back. He kept on coming back. But his resurgence with the Cardinals and, you know, eventually take him to the Super Bowl, people probably see that as something, you know, looking back in the past and don't really realize kind of how shocking it was for a player who had bounced around a bit, always was pretty efficient throwing, but just did not seem to have the confidence that he once did because of all the fact that he could not stay on the field with injuries. Um and he had, let's face it, pretty amazing supporting cast when we talk about his successful runs, at least at wide receiver. He was throwing to uh, Torrey Holt and Isaac Bruce and Marshall Falk when he was with the St. Louis Rams. And then he had Larry Fitzgerald and Anquan Bolden in uh, in Arizona. So I get why his, contra you know, his Hall of Fame selection could be a little bit controversial for some. I think 25th is a good ranking for him. If you had him much higher or much lower, I think it'd be a bit weird. I'm fine having him in there, being that you have the three Super Bowl appearances, you have the two MVPs. That's enough for me. And he gets there on career value. Even though he didn't start a whole lot, getting up to 26 on career value shows you how much he was able to accumulate during that period of time. All right. 
This is a guy a lot of people are probably not going to know about because uh, he's an oldie. This is one of the, the oldest guy in this little subset here. Norm Van Brocklin comes in at 24th on the GOAT QB list. His career in the 25th rank, his peaks 32, his playoffs 23. So all kind of in that 20 to 30-ish sort of range there. Uh, the Dutchman is who is what they call Norm Van Brocklin. He played for the Los Angeles Rams from 49 to 57, and he played for the Eagles from 58 to 60. His accolades, Hall of Fame, first-team All-Pro in his final – this both happened – a first-team All-Pro happened in his final season at 34 years old. Two-time NFL champion. Remember, this is before the Super Bowls, so just of the NFL. And he was also one of the 22 finalists for the NFL 100 team, but he didn't make the roster. So that gives you an idea that he has a very high – um, perception of him that goes past his stats is seen as being a a foundational player for for passing at quarterback. He's seen as being one of these 22 finalists for the NFL 100 team. Uh, he's a little slight at 6'1", 190 pounds, but though you have to consider the era for that. He led the NFL in yards per attempt four different times. He has the second best career yards per attempt behind Otto Graham. Uh, and, he, and he led the league in adjusted yards per attempt twice. So he doesn't have sack history for most of his years. But if you look at the sack uh, stats, you can get sack yards from different places. It was on the low side. So he was good also at avoiding sacks. It was funny when he went to the Eagles in 58, when they passed a lot, there was a team that had about a 55% pass ratio back in 1958, where teams were running it between 55 to 60% of the time. So he really elevated the passing game and bringing it forward. And he made it to nine Pro Bowls. So it's like consistent good play there. Nine Pro Bowls. And he holds the single game record for passing yards in one game. It's kind of interesting. 554 yards. in happened in 1951. So here we are, um, 71 years later, still holds the record for passing yards in a game. There are a lot of intangibles. I think they have, need to go into Van Brocklin's play that we don't quite know about. I'll bring up some footage of him to, to the stream here that you can look at him play where supposedly he was just the first to really use more of a scientific approach to quarterback play. See the quick pass here. It almost looks like uh, Peyton Manning, the way that he would just step back and pass the ball here. He has a lot of pump fakes, a lot of scientific play. Supposedly John Madden says that he kind of taught him how to, how to watch film and how to think about the game and passing. And he was also talked about quite often with his um, – with some of his backups as far as how he approached the game that it just took a step forward back in the fifties and sixties for how quarterback play could be, but it doesn't necessarily show up in, in the statistics. And that's what makes him one of these top, top quarterbacks of all time, but is going to be lost somewhat in my rankings here. Okay. Next and familiar name. Definitely here. Ben Roethlisberger, big Ben 23rd, 20th in his career rating but only 37th in his peak does not have the peak peak play here. 35th as far as his playoffs, again, a, a worse number than you might suspect for someone who's, who's won a couple of Super Bowls. Okay. So let's go to Roethlisberger 2004 to 2021 is not eligible for the hall of fame, but I think he's pretty much a lock for the hall of fame. Two time Super Bowl champion, also a loss in the Super Bowl. He was offensive rookie of the year. But no, no first team or second team all pros. And if you look, even Pro Bowl selections, I should have written this down, but I know that he is light on Pro Bowl selections. Let me bring it up for the exact thing here. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, I mean, six isn't awful, but considering the fact that he played so many seasons, it's not great. Um, and again, just not getting a single MVP vote. I believe in his, his entire career. So you want to talk about Russell Wilson when it comes to that, you know, Roethlisberger is another guy who falls into that, that category. So he was more of an accumulator than a peak player. Uh, 14 of his 18 seasons where he was a starter, he had above average efficiency by adjusted net yards per attempt, but he never had the high highs. He had one of the craziest transitions as far as style of play. When he went from a low volume downfield passer who took a ton of sacks to later in his career, which maybe a lot of people remember more now is the fact that he couldn't get the ball out of his hand quick enough. These last few seasons was not throwing the ball down the field, was not taking in any sacks, lowest time to throw in the NFL. He was almost the opposite. And it, and it, 
it didn't hurt his stats substantially, all the sacks he took, but he was definitely using that lever a lot as far as juicing, being able to get the ball down the field there. I mean, it's just crazy to think about Ben Roethlisberger, who never takes, is trying to never take sacks now. Um, he had a worse than average sack rate in his first eight seasons in a row. And then in the nine of his last 10 seasons, he was better than average sack rate. He led the NFL in sack yards multiple times early in his career. He also twice led the NFL in yards per completion. And then he had one of the shortest average depth of targets near the end of his career. And when you think about the playoffs for him, why is he 35th? Why is he fairly low? Despite the fact that he played a lot of, you know, he played a lot of playoff games here. Let me see how many playoff games he has here. Played in 23 playoff games. So that's a lot. That gives him a lot of opportunity to accumulate value. The issue is his net is adjusted net yards per attempt during all of those playoff appearances was six versus a regular season average closer to seven. So he didn't step up in those playoff games. He was above average. He generated, you know, some value in there, but he wasn't, you know, an all time great player in the playoffs, despite the fact that the team played pretty well and they ended up having really good results in the playoffs. All in all, I think he's a little overrated, probably putting him at 23rd here on this list. But like I said, he's a lock Hall of Famer. He's going to get in uh, first ballot. I have no perception as to what level you need to be to be a first ballot Hall of Famer or not. But Ben will be be close to that. All right, let's go to number 22 here. Warren Moon. Warren Moon, number 22. Now, before I stay, start anything here, I'm going to say that these numbers here that you're seeing, everything is just as NFL stuff. It's not including the CFL stuff before that, but I think that's good context to think about when we're thinking about these, uh, the Warren, Warren Moon's numbers and his stats and all that stuff. So he's 22nd on the list here. His career number is 27, and that's where it comes out The la if he just had more time in the NFL. Even though he had a very, very long NFL career, he still missed the majority of his prime. Uh, playing in the CFL. His peak is 19, a bit stronger. Playoffs, eh, not so great at, at 37. So he played for the Houston Oilers from 84 to 93. Then he also went to the Vikings for three years, the Seahawks for a couple of years. And then he finished up in Kansas City as a backup for a couple of years. Accolades here for Warren Moon. He is in the Hall of Fame. One second team all pro. And he received MVP votes in three different seasons. He finished as high as third in the MVP voting in 1990 behind Joe Montana and Randall Cunningham. Now, what's interesting about that year that he was third behind Joe Montana, the MVP is if you compared him to Montana that, that season in 1990, he had more completions, a higher completion percentage, more yards, more yards per attempt, more net yards per attempt more yards per completion, more touchdowns, a higher touchdown percentage, a lower <laughs> interception rate, more rushing yards, more touchdowns, everything, basically. And, you know, he was not playing with Jerry Rice, yet he did not quite get enough love there because the team success was never quite on that level. So he was a successful college player. He's the MVP of the 1978 Rose Bowl. But I don't have the details or I haven't done enough research to figure out why he did not make the NFL, but he didn't, and he decided – Rather than try to fight as an undrafted player, he spent six years in the Canadian Football League. Was racism an element there? Probably. How could it not be? But uh, I can't say definitively what sort of level prospect that he was at, that he was really getting shunned there. So he played in the CFL five straight championships, starting from his second year in the CFL until his last year in the CFL, playing for the Edmonton Eskimos. And so he didn't enter the NFL until he was 28 years old, but still. He started at least 10 games in 14 different seasons, but didn't get to the NFL until he was 28 years old. He retired as the third leading passer in NFL history in passing yards, fourth in touchdowns, all while missing the age 23 through 28 of his life. I mean, imagine that from 22, well, I guess 22 to 27, I should say. So he didn't have those five, six seasons in the NFL, which he could have added to all of those stats, perhaps he would have ended his career as the most prolific passer in NFL history if he got a chance much earlier. I'm not going to give the CFL stats, which are enormous. He's passing for like 5,000 yards a season in, in the CFL. I'm not going to give those the same sort of standing that you would give NFL stats, but you can't ignore them. And you especially can't ignore them knowing how successful Moon was once he got to the NFL. If you had Moon ranked as high as, I don't know, the mid-teens? I would not argue with that. 
I would not argue with that. I know he didn't have the playoff success, but the guy, as far as a talent and his ability to elevate teams, even when he went on beyond Houston, never playing on a on a packed sort of superstar lineup team there, was really is really unquestioned. And one of the biggest what ifs in NFL history is if he would have been able to play early in his career, would he have been celebrated not only as you know, this this underdog story and this black quarterback who was able to be so successful in the NFL, but then also potentially owning every record in the NFL record book with how prolific he was. And he was someone who was allowed to pass a lot. When you're allowed to pass a lot, it means you're probably pretty good at passing. All right, we're going to round it up here with number 21, and that is another current quarterback, Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson comes in at 21st, his career is 21st, his peak is 28th, and his playoff number is 25th. So what he's a he's not like he's he's kind of in that same Ben Roethlisberger sort of mold, a little bit of an accumulator without high-end season play, without high-end accolades, without high-end peak, but a lot of value that he accumulated, and especially the rushing value, where it may not be as big of a component as his game as it used to be, but it helps boost him quite a lot, according to the numbers that I have here. Okay, let's let's go through Wilson here. Obviously, 2012 to 2021 on the Seahawks. Now he'll be with the Broncos. He's going to have a chance to get a lot more stats here at, you know, 35 years old or 33 years old. I mean, let me look him up. I should, probably should have known that before starting to talk about it. Um, I want to say he's 34. Let's see. How old is he? Russell Wilson, 33. Oh, yeah. So he's going to have a chance to accumulate a lot more stats here as long as his mobility declining doesn't kind of kill his game here. So he's going to have a chance to accumulate on a statistical basis, easily getting into the top 20 quarterbacks here. I think he's a lock for, for the Hall of Fame. But if we're talking about accolades, he has a Super Bowl championship, Super Bowl loss to the Patriots where they, you know, they really should have won that game. Um, he's third. He was third in Offensive Player of the Year. Um Famously, zero MVP votes, but he has been to the Pro Bowl nine times. So he's a consistent, consistent Pro Bowl quality play above even what we saw for Roethlisberger. It's a tough era to play quarterback to be above any of these other guys. Um, rushing value. So I think the rushing value here, if you look at what Wilson has, let me let me look up Wilson's total rushing value because it's one of the bigger numbers here, even though you wouldn't necessarily think it. So he's eighth overall in his rushing value that he's added over his career. 4,700 yards, 23 touchdowns. That adds a lot to him. He's had above average passer. He's been above average passer every single one of his 10 NFL seasons. So even the years where people say he was struggling these last couple of years, he still was giving you at least average efficiency in adjusted net yards per attempt. Now that might overrate him slightly because the sacks he's taking are probably more of a detriment than the calculation, which just subtracts out the sack yards from your passing yards. It, it just lowers your passing yards by sack yards. It's probably worse than that. So maybe he's a little bit overrated that, by that, but still, this is the metric I'm using for everyone and he's above average, but he has, you know, he's never maxed out very high. He was third in 2015, which was probably his best season in adjusted net yards per attempt. Outside of that, he's been, He's been, he hasn't been in the top five any other season in his career other than 2015. So it just doesn't have that high end play. Sacks have been the Achilles heel. He's been below average in sack rate every single season, sometimes substantially below average. So that's something that's kept his numbers down a bit here. I think Wilson is probably a little bit overrated at this 21 number. Again, he'll continue to accumulate and get into the teens where this is probably where he should really settle as far as his final uh, career ranking barring the fact that he goes on to win you know an mvp or really take his game to a new level here with the broncos which he's going to have a strong team but a very stacked afc west and afc to get out of to accumulate more of that high-end sort of stuff all right everybody that was it for qb's 30 through 21 i think it's getting a little bit more entertaining as we're getting higher here on Wednesday, I'm going to hit you with whatever may be going on in the world of the NFL. Also go 20 through 11, just to give you a little preview here. Uh, two quarterbacks that people may think should be higher. Um, John Elway and Brett Favre are in this category here, as opposed to being in the top 10. Um, but again, I'm going back pretty far on this. So I have some quarterbacks from the who played in the 50s and 60s who were 
uh, a couple of guys who were who were in the top 10 that people may not even suspect as being in that sort of range, pushing some others out of there. But I think it's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be fun. I'm sure everyone will agree 100% with all my different rankings there. Uh, we have one current player. Current player. Uh, beyond Tom Brady, of course, Tom Brady. I came up, I almost forgot that Tom Brady was a current player. So Tom Brady, of course, is, is on the list. We have another current player who makes it in the 20 to 11 category who people are going to, there's going to be some controversy about, about him. Not probably not being a log for a hall of fame, couple of players who are recent, either current player or recent players who are not really logs for the hall of fame, but are going to be in that top 20 category later this week. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Go ahead, rate, review the pod. If you want to go onto iTunes, if you want to leave comments on YouTube, I go ahead, I read those. I collect them from mailbag episodes in the future, or, you know, I'll shoot you a reply on there too. If you want to tell me how awful my rankings are, I'm just going to tell you, well, you know, that's like your opinion, you know, uh, I'll be like the dude back here who's behind me, um, in my studio here. All right, everyone. Also, you can shoot me, uh, anything on Twitter at Kevin Cole PFF or an email Kevin.Cole at pff.com. Thank you so much for tuning in. I truly appreciate it. And otherwise I am going to be talking at everyone on Wednesday. All right. Thanks so much.